Hey there, I am here with Denise Zavitson today. Denise is a speaker, an author, and empowerment coach. She has a story of tragedy and loss though. And while that could have been the end, it was just the beginning for Denise. She spent six months at a Buddhist community in California and a year in an isolated cabin in Tennessee. And she has now dedicated her life to helping others create a life filled with joy and purpose. So thank you for being here, Denise. Oh, thank you, Renee. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Absolutely. You have an online course coming out soon called Awaken to Joy. And I love that title so much because I don't think joy just happens. It's something we choose and we have to be aware of it. And I love that, that concept of the thought of awakening it, kind of like shaking it and saying, hey, it's time to get up. Exactly. Exactly. Where did that name come from? Well, I think exactly what you're talking about and probably reflective of my journey it was an awakening and it, you know, just like when you wake up in the morning, it kind of eases, you ease into a fully awakened. Um, I, it, it happens very much the same way. And I think it starts with becoming mindful, becoming aware, and then starting to live in a conscious, in a conscious way. So you talk about something tragic happening in your life and how that was kind of the point where you said something has to be different or something has to change. Can you share that journey? Absolutely. So uh, it was, um, I guess, uh, it's been several years ago now, but my, my mother, my father and a sister were all in a car accident. Oh my um, mom and dad were left in a, uh, were, were killed. And then my sister was left in a coma. She was 46 at the time. And you know, when that happens, I, I always talk about how we're all just it's kind of that row, row, row your boat, right? We're all just floating downstream and things are doing what they do. And then all of a sudden there's that defining moment and world, the world changed. It was one way and then it, it, you, it was the other within a, a second. And, and it, was a, it was a wake up call for me, um, a little bit of a breakdown moment. Mm. And, and I, I, I talk about feeling like Humpty Dumpty, you know, you're just crumble and you have to start picking up the pieces and pulling yourself together. Um, my sister lived for four years, but she remained in a persistent vegetative state. And that was a whole other, you know, kind of experience um, that brought everybody together because we all shared in our common grief. And there were, there were lessons everywhere, Renee, you know, it just. Um, How do you overcome something like that? Yeah, well, Everybody grieves differently. I, I actually was really fortunate in two ways. One, I had gone, I was in the process of moving and I had returned home to say goodbye to my parents, which was in hindsight, like the most magical opportunity. Um, the, the second was I was working in hospice and volunteering in hospice. And so I had a little bit of an inside, inside track on the grieving process. And I understood it was a grieving process, but I think what you, what you do is typically, you know, come together, try to form connections, which I've found to be one of my founding principles now is forming the importance of connections in all ways, um, with yourself, with others, with nature. And, and then um, the second thing is to just start with the little things you can do. You know, in the process of grieving, can you brush your teeth and and just be there brushing your teeth and can you brush can you make it through your hair one day and um and so little teeny teeny baby steps and and you come back to find yourself and it's not the same self you're right. you're, you're a new a new individual and from this this awful tragedy you then went to the buddhist monastery as I well did. as uh, spent some time alone in the cabin in Tennessee. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Because I'm so fascinated by it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It, I've always been on a, I, I feel I've always been on a spiritual path. Mm -hmm. I, I had a very strong draw to that from the time I was in my teens, <clears throat> but you know, was raised Catholic and got married and did the traditional stuff. And 
when this happened, I really felt a calling to, to dig deeper. I felt there was an opportunity and I really live with the belief that wisdom is a choice and that choice comes from, from choosing to be conscious or create more uh, opportunity for awareness in our lives. And so going to the Buddhist community was a time for intense meditation. I mean, you know, more than, more than an hour and a half a day and then a lot of silent uh, work. So they, they actually um, have a, the community as a working community. And so a lot of times your day is spent, spent in silent meditation and practicing mindfulness. So that was, that was a great foundation. When I returned, I was in the process of, of doing a lot of writing. And I felt like I still wanted to stay off of the, the merry-go-round. Mm. And so I found a cabin. I, I, I'm a big fan of Thoreau. And I thought, well, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. <laughs> so I found a little cabin in this beautiful secluded um, spot along the Buffalo River in Tennessee. And uh, no heat. Wow. <laughs> so I had to learn how to build a fire. And, you know, there were just, it was just a magical experience. But it brought me back to myself. And got and and allowed me to, while I was in nature and alone in nature, and there was connection there. It also almost forced me to turn inside and find and create that connection back with my true self. And how did you deal with the being alone versus being lonely? Oh, that's that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, that's a, that's such a differentiator. And I spent several years after following my divorce and, and actually following the tragedy in relationships that that were not healthy or maybe not not right, not a good fit. And I was so lonely in those. And when I got and and I just kept on the same wheel. I'd be I'd get be in a relationship and and it just didn't work out or I'd try to be that who that person, you know, would want and it didn't feel right. It didn't last. And, and I felt so lonely. And so when I went to the cabin where I was, it didn't happen overnight that I was not lonely, but I was alone. And that forced me to connect to my inside, to my, my true self. And that's when I found that I wasn't lonely anymore. I didn't wow. really need anyone else to, to, you know, complete me. And, oh, and I, I run, or I don't know if it's ironically or even by chance, but it was after that year that I met my, my current husband and it has been the best, most best, healthiest relationship I've ever had. Mm. It's, it's been wonderful. But I, I attribute that to, to the fact that I came to know myself. I gave myself mm. a chance to figure out what, what, what's in here. Right. And so often after a divorce, we jump into a relationship that isn't a good fit either. And sometimes it's the opposite of our ex. Yeah. And we're not making better choices necessarily. We're trying to fill a void. And I think that's so important too, to, um, you know, I've, I've, I'm on my third marriage um, and I have put the space in between two and three to be to land where you are now as well and to have something just really whole and wonderful. But that second one was the, the mistake. That was the filler, you know? So, yeah. um, I think it happens so often and, and it happens sometimes that, you know, we, uh, we get married at a young age. We're trying to fulfill a promise that we thought we were supposed to be, or it's a marriage looks like this. Um, oftentimes that second marriage is, you know, a pendulum swing from the first, well, we did it this way. Now we're going to do it another way. Right. Or we just repeat what we were doing in the first one. I personally don't feel that there are failures or mistakes mm. if we can learn from them. Yeah. And I think there's the opportunity when we are in relationships, they are, they are learning opportunities. And if we're bumping up against somebody all the time, or we're giving up our power, that's that's an opportunity for us to learn that we're maybe not in the right space right right and so from this journey you actually emerged from the cabin with some uh lessons and i think that your work is built around this right yeah. can you yeah. talk a little bit about that 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, th I think, you know, they're not, uh, they're spiritual, they're not religious, there's no denomination. And what I feel like in along my course, I've found kind of a golden thread that I feel like runs through every religion. And for me, there are seven foundation principles that I try to structure my life around and I think is very helpful in this awakening to joy. And, and they are, you know, the, the, the lesson of impermanence. And each day we treat it, if, we, if we'll treat it as a gift, if we'll understand that there's no guarantee that five minutes from now I'm going to be here or a loved one's going to be here. And that's not to say, oh, we're morbid and let's like dig into them, right? But, but, but to say I can honor what I have now because it's precious. It's truly a gift. And so, one, mm -hmm, go ahead. One of your affirmations is change. And that's a tough one because that's usually the thing that everyone pushes back against and they don't want change. It's uncomfortable and it's uncertain. So what do you say to someone who is going through a divorce and it's the change that is so overwhelming for them? Yeah. So we do, we, we as humans get stuck into this place of, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm afraid, right? And so on the other side of change or the other side of resistance of change is fear. I'm afraid of what can happen. And uh, often if we can reframe that, if we can say change is what brings us, it, it is what happens in life. It's just our constant. And, and it is the one thing we can count on is that we will, things and we as people and uh, everything changes. So when we can start to let go of some of our expectations and start to accept that change just is, um, and it's not easy. It doesn't happen overnight, but there is opportunity on the other side of that. So I, I think if we can sit, again, meditation is so important, or prayer, or reflection, whatever you, whatever feels comfortable. Um, just mindfulness. If we can get an awareness that that there is opportunity and change, and let's look for that opportunity versus holding ourselves in in fear. Right. And I think that goes hand in hand with expectation too, because I think that's another big one that we see surface in divorces. And often it's the expectation of a marriage that would last forever. And now that's no longer the case. And can you speak a little bit on expectation? Yeah, uh, expectations for me, holding on to expectations or, or and even attachments, and that can be physical um, or, or, or you know, um, more, more um, esoteric, but the expectations, well, marriages are supposed to last, and we are supposed to be good wives, and I remember in my divorce, it was, it was, um, I, I had gone to therapy, and the therapist said, Denise, you know, what, what, what do you want, and I said, I don't, I don't know, I, he's not a bad husband, he doesn't cheat, he doesn't do any of this stuff, and I said, I don't know, you, I can't really get divorced because he's not a bad husband. Right. He said, are you happy? And I said, no, I feel like I'm giving up my soul. Yeah. And, and so what he was saying to me is, what is the true purpose? You're accepting somebody else's, you're attached to somebody else's version of what life should be like or marriage should be like. Right. I, as far as I'm concerned, my 12 year marriage was very successful because we had two children. We've remained a family. And so we, we took it and redefined divorce mm. and what, was, what a successful family was. And Denise, I think that's one of the hardest things to wrap your head around when you speak of, you were in a, not a bad marriage, but you weren't happy. And, you know, I felt that way with my first marriage. And for me, it was, what is wrong with me that I'm not happy? I have nothing to complain about. Like, what's wrong girl you know mm -hmm. and that's so hard to wrap your head around and especially when you have other people saying to you like what's wrong with you you know like how do you reconcile your own happiness when you almost feel selfish mm -hmm. yeah it does feel selfish and i i felt like as you said i felt like i was robbing my children of a mm -hmm. of a normal family right and and honestly i think it took me going back at least on a personal level, and saying, what is, what is my purpose in life? Is my purpose in life when it's all said and done to be able to say she was married for, you know, 152 years. I don't know that that was, was a good fit for me in terms of purpose of life. 
um, for me, there's there's a, a a purpose that we each have as we're living our lives. And I'm not certain that you know. I think there was a there's a line in in a movie that you know geese stay together forever, um, but we're not geese, right? Right. <laughs> it was Robert Redford, maybe. <laughs> and, and I think that it takes some of that reflection and finding your own values is marriage more important than than happiness and and figuring out that value um I, as far as i'm concerned a, a good divorce trumps a bad marriage hmm. and so how would you describe a good divorce well I, for me good divorce means retaining respect um i knowing that each of each of us is on a path and respecting each other's path um if there's children involved involved obviously keeping peace for the children and part of that means that understanding that each, our children look at at us as 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 their role models but also as a piece of them we're a kind of insight to who they are themselves and when we disparage the other the the spouse or the or the partner uh, the other parent then it is reflects back on the on the child mm -hmm. and we I, I think it's very difficult to raise healthy um well-adjusted children when we are disparaging and so and it doesn't serve a good purpose so. right and, and the studies show that it's not the divorce that causes your kids problems it's the conflict absolutely yeah. it, it's the conflict one of your affirmations is an inner knowing, and I think that just complements what we were just talking about as to figuring out what happiness is and, and why it why isn't just being in something that is fine good enough. Um, what is an inner knowing? So I believe that that each of us has a deeper spirit and 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 a deeper uh, it, it is the the truest sense of who we are and there's wisdom in that but it doesn't come from our head which is comprised of our shoulds and our our musts that come from society our parents mm -hmm. I, I i equate this like a seed you know if i if i plant a seed and it's an and it's and i put it in the ground and it grows up and i want it to be an apple and it turns out that it's a tomato you know i i'm disappointed in it but if I just accept it for what it is, when it sprouts and it bears fruit, then then I can be, then I then it because it knows what it is. It's not what I'm wanting it to be. Mm. And I think each of us is kind of that. We each have our own seed inside, but but it gets layered over and it gets layered over with shoulds and musts and all of that. What what our parents want, what our teachers want. Right. right. And when we can start to be. Uh, quiet uh, call it mindfulness call it meditation whatever it is when we can start to be quiet and spend time maybe it's just don't turn the radio on when you get in the car just give yourself five minutes to just be there uh, i think we'll start to hear that voice inside that comes out and says here's your you know here's who, here's where you where you belong yeah and so it's just to turning down the noise and listening to yourself I think strongly that just turning down the noise and you know women often are are very guilty of that we are the caretakers often and so our lives get so busy we're on kind of treadmills and we're taking care of the children taking care of the house and often we don't take that time to take care of ourselves and we lose touch we start to almost lose touch with that inner that inner being um, our true seed right right mm -hmm. yeah well that's good I mean I I love that and I love to drive and not have the radio on. And then sometimes I catch myself like talking to myself, <laughs> but I feel like it's the inner voice kind of coming out. And I'm just like, if I say it, then I'll remember it. Yeah, absolutely. I, absolutely. I think that there's so much wisdom when we can turn inside hmm. and get out of our head, start, start listening. I call it listening with your heart. And another one of your affirmations is gratitude. And that's a really hard one when someone feels so stuck and their world is crashing in on them. And that's what at least a divorce feels like. How can someone feel gratitude when they feel like everything is going wrong? Yeah. Well, you know, when we talked about 
change and acceptance and, and finding the lesson and all that, often we can, we can find gratitude, if we can find gratitude first in the obvious, right? I'm so happy I can have a cup of coffee. I'm, I'm grateful for running water. Find gratitude in the obvious and then eventually stretch a little bit beyond that to start to say, where's my gratitude in this marriage? And, the, and a lot of times that can come from what have I learned? What have I learned about myself from this marriage? What have I learned about others? Has the marriage given me children I love? Mm. Has it taught me a little bit more about myself that I might not have gotten to if I hadn't had this pushback from somebody that was so different from me? Right. Or, uh, yeah, so. It, is it a stretch to ask someone to have gratitude for their spouse who maybe cheated or maybe wasn't kind? Well, I think, I think that everything has to happen in its own time. So you, nobody needs to be feel forced to have gratitude for someone who's been unkind to them. But when you can release that hurt, say it wasn't about me, it was something lacking or lesson they needed about themselves. And then, and then yes, I think find gratitude for the fact that they brought you an awareness that's going to make you stronger on the other side. Mm. It's, it's that old line, that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger, right? And if we don't have that, we won't get to that other place. Wow, that's a, that's a great way of thinking about it. And it's a little twist because so often, though, people really, they play the blame game. And everything is the other person's fault. And yeah. so you're saying instead, let's say thank you for, <laughs> for making me realize that this is not the best place for me to be. And maybe there's more out there. Absolutely. You know, when, when, when our cup is so full, uh, there's no room for anything to come in. Mm -hmm. And if, we're, if we've got a cup of, of sour milk and we pour that milk out, wash the glass out a little bit, we have an opportunity to pour some great other drink in there that's fresh and new. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And so your affirmations, um, how is someone to use them to help them and in the now, like as of today? Do you know, I still, it's been, uh, I've, it's been more than 10 years since I've composed them. And, and I, they, I really feel like they don't belong to me. They came through me, but I, I can't really take credit for them probably. But um, I still use them every day and, you know, I've recorded them and you can listen to them or, or I, I've got uh, copies on the website and um, I do them every day and because it's a good reminder, you know, it's a five minute kind of thing that says, okay, there's, there's impermanence, there's change. What can I, how can I let go or release expectations today? How can I bring gratitude in today? And so it just is a little guiding light as I move through the day. Almost like a mantra. A little bit right. like a mantra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the affirmations is also non-attachment. And I think this one is really interesting. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. So, so attachment, and attachments um, and, and expectations are closely associated mm -hmm. are, are what I believe bring us, bring us stress or bring us um, suffering. And, and when we can release that, so you mentioned before about a spouse, how can we be grateful, you know, for a spouse that's hurt me? When I become attached to the idea that someone's hurt me and I'm taking on a victim role, mm -hmm. it doesn't allow me to rise above that. And, and so it's really part of what's causing my suffering. The minute I can let go of that attachment, then, then I'm freed. I, I, it's an empowering Mm. action. And you can even say, you know, there's possessions in divorce, you're yep. splitting up physical items, right? Mm. And I can be attached to this thing. You know, maybe it was my grandmother's plate. In the scheme of things, when I can separate myself from that, when I can become an observer in it, and get some perspective, there's an opportunity to say what really has value here. Right. Is this worth what it's costing me internally? And what will it take? What could, it, what could I replace it with down the road that might be even better? We see that all of the time with the house. 
because people have an attachment that they want the house and maybe because it's a oh that feels like a win or they think the kids will want to spend more time there if they have the house but often it's not a practical decision and that's a question i always ask is really why do you want the house and it's this attachment you know and so it's so interesting and i think that that lesson is so important for anyone going through a divorce to really separate out why they're asking for what they want or why they're so committed in in really digging in for this this ask and it's so so many times it's emotional i think absolutely and and it it often is a weapon that that comes out um that that requires that perspective and maybe some introspection and self-examination of it. Um, perspective is a great, op a great tool, you know, and when you become, become that observer and, and you can actually say, look at those two people down there fighting over that house. What, what's that all about? What is it really that important? Right. Right. So interesting. And so how can someone find you and work with you? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a, an empowerment coach, so I have a website. It's called uh, Awaken to Joy. Um, Awaken to Joy is the course. And then I'm at denisesavitson.com on all of the social media items as, or platforms as well. Awesome. And do you have any future trips planned on a mountain this time? Or <laughs> <laughs> You know what? My inner voice has been saying India, so Ooh. I don't know. <laughs> No, no time soon, probably, but, but um, that's, I've got kind of a calling there. All right. I can't wait to follow your journey. Thank you so much, Denise, and thank you. Oh, for Renee, thank you. Thank you for sharing the affirmations. Everyone needs to go check them out because they're so important. So thank you. Thank you.